Hey, hi. Welcome to Someone Else's Movie, the podcast where an actor, writer, director, or nebulous industry figure gives a little love to a movie they didn't make. I'm Norm Wilner, senior film writer for Now Magazine, and this is The Other Thing I Do. My guest this week is Dave McKeon, a man who's been making magnificent art in a variety of disciplines. In comics, he's given form and flesh to Neil Gaiman's Sandman and Grant Morrison's Batman, and published his own graphic novels, Cages, Pictures That Tick, and Pictures That Tick 2, Exhibition. He's also a photographer, painter, author, and cookbook collaborator. His film work includes the features Mirror Mask, The Gospel of Us, and Luna, and most recently he's been touring the world with his multimedia show Black Dog, The Dreams of Paul Nash. Dave picked The Street of Crocodiles, a 1986 animated short by the Brothers Key, which translates a short story by the author Bruno Schultz into a 20-minute odyssey of personal and psychosexual anxiety performed entirely by stop-motion puppets. It's a short film, and thus a shorter-than-usual episode. I hope that's okay with everybody. Now, as is becoming more frequent this summer, a small note about the sound quality. Dave was in town for the Toronto Comic Arts Festival earlier this spring, and his schedule was so jammed he couldn't make it to the studio. Which is fine, we ended up in a hotel conference room, but not right away. So the first few minutes of the episode were recorded sat on a couch outside the conference room, which was locked and which we didn't know we were going to have access to. People were walking by, it's, it's a bit busy. But just know that you won't have to put up with the background chatter for very long. Then you get to deal with the hum of a fluorescent light. This is someone else's movie. Well, um, I d- discovered uh, Street of Crocodiles and the Quays brothers' work generally. Um, they, there was a season of their films on television uh, back when the BBC and Channel 4 in England really supported animation. Um, and there were competitions and there were good, healthy slots in the schedule for animated films. And uh, they showed a lot of their short films over one Christmas. And I was trying to think of the date. It must have been something like um, 1985. Okay. So I was still at art school. And uh, it made for a very weird Christmas. It really coloured <laughs> Christmas because I recorded them and then watched them every day, um, especially Street of Crocodiles. And um, I'd never seen anything quite like it. It keyed back to silent cinema for me, um, which I really loved. Um, even then, I really had a, had a love for silent films, especially... Um, fantastical stories or imaginative stories mm. told using the tools they had a hundred years ago because you very you really see um, a bunch of creators with a whole new toolbox and inventing the language of film uh, in front of your eyes yeah. and I really love that when you can see that and sometimes it's, it's, it's creaky and it doesn't quite work and sometimes there's a real struggle there but sometimes they, they hit on something because they see, they're doing it for the very first time it, the power of it is really quite extraordinary mm-hmm. so I saw some of that in that film yeah well, and the creakiness is the story Definitely. In, a, in a really odd way yeah. I, I always forget just how hand worn their stuff is yeah, even, even as they get more um, technically accomplished even as they grow into feature uh, filmmaking and even the combinations of things they've done where they're playing with different types of they're really they're messy and they're they're strangely organic even when they're completely sterile well I think they're never completely sterile yeah well I think that they obviously love Tarkovsky's films and that's that sort of East European aesthetic Mm -hmm. and the thing that they've taken from that or learnt from that is that everything has had a life so every bit of peeling wallpaper every label Every doll's face, every screw, every nut, every bit of texture on a wall. Um, it's, it's filled with um, the lives that have been through it already. So you accumulate all that stuff and the ghosts are present, you know. So it's thick, thick atmosphere. Mm-hmm. And again, that's what I love about silent films. The, the thickness of the, of the atmosphere in those rooms, the hazy light and the dust and the scratches and the sort of slightly pulsing glow of the of the uh, the image yeah. um, it's not realistic it has something of the real world to it obviously because it was shot with actors and whatever silent films um, but it's been translated through this um, extraordinary imaginative filter of the medium at that time now everything looks pristine and photographic and that can be great but it's lost something for me it's lost that strange 
otherworldliness that mm-hmm. we get from those films. It's it's striking to see creators now pushing to go back to the older, messier thing. I'm, I'm thinking about Guy Madden's work where yeah, he's, he's aggressively trying to, digitally now to replicate the feel of film burning and splicing yeah. and, yes. and jumps in the in the in the gate and all yeah. of that. And and what the Quays are doing wa- is doing it with technology that is essentially still the same. I mean, it's it's not replication. They are using the old techniques of stop motion and and, and trick photography and, and yes. simple elements. Yes, I mean they they've they've started using using a digital camera. I think okay. just for the sheer ease of it, um, and they've started using some digital composition. But their aesthetic is so much of a particular time and. Uh, accumulation of those influences mm-hmm. it's always going to be there yeah it's good this is quite noisy here do you want to try and get this up room yeah maybe we should maybe we should otherwise we're going to keep on stopping and the pickup will work just about as well mm. so where were we um first experiences of it short films technology yes. yes trying to figure out how things work yeah and also reasons why choosing it i think maybe we should yeah well, that fascinates me endlessly. Whatever, whatever brings people to stuff. Well, I mean, there are a number of reasons as well. Um, I, I really loved the fact that the, the piece was simply imagery and music, mm-hmm. um, no dialogue at all. There's one little, rather obscure quote from Bruno Schultz's book at the end, but basically, it's just this um, strange labyrinthine little story um, or or trail, really. Um, with this beautiful music, Leszek Jankowski's music. Um, the odd sound effect, not even everything has a sound effect, some things are let go mm-hmm. without not, without uh, reference to the sounds that they make. Um, and I I almost felt that, the, that they discovered a new form of narrative, really, a new form of filmmaking. Mm. Um, something where you barely, it's not really about story, it just but it's absolutely compelling. One moment leads to another, and the emotional resonance in the scene, even though you've got puppets with no moving facial expressions, they're not like actors, um, you have this these strange camera moves that they've inherited a bit from Schwankmeyer, but they're still very much their own. And then this extraordinary set, which is pregnant with ghosts and dust and the light, you know, the lives that all of these weird objects have had already. Yeah. Um, so it's absolutely compelling, moment to moment. But you look back on it, you can really say what the story was, particularly, yeah. or where we came from or where we've gone. And yet it, I've been absolutely gripped by it. The thing is, it's 22 minutes or so long. Mm. I think it would be tough to do that for an hour and a half. Yeah, I don't know that... What, what Watching it... While I was watching it, I kept thinking it was like watching someone navigate a game. Yeah, there's a bit of that. Uh, or even a, a sort of art installation or something like that. Mm-hmm. You're it, wandering through a space. It has a sense of where interactive media could go if it really had some brains about it. And at the time, there was none of this. None of that. At all. There were text games. I think that yeah. was about it. And, and it also felt like them exploring the form um, and trying out little ideas and then finding a way of piecing those moments together you know shooting little bugs in the dust and knowing there'll be a place for that somewhere yeah um, the strange recurring imagery of the screws the screws are beautiful they make sense but they don't make sense no I mean, there, there's an emotional logic to but, an inanimate object exactly that's the thing you, you, you really get a feeling for, for but you can't really get a grip on why you've got yeah. that feeling because you haven't been led there from a, through a through a uh, uh, traditional narrative, um, the music is exquisite, but it's not um, it's not telling you how to feel. Yeah, it doesn't direct you. It doesn't direct you. It just between between the sound and the, these extraordinary images and the music, it just evokes such a deep feeling. Um, I suppose you have to be sensitive to that I mean I'm sure there are plenty of people who just think well they're nonsense yeah. um, but I really love the literature and film and the uh, poster design from Poland and you see some of Starobieszki's posters at the beginning of the film and I love all of that stuff um, so it really got to me it really got in, in, into my blood yeah. it just seems so 
inconceivable that would be broadcast as a matter of course on television. I mean, in Canada, we had nothing like that. There was no. But, this, uh, but the Canadian film board uh, anima- is is renowned. The animation, the shorts. The animation. But that's it. We never. The documentaries were never run on television. Oh, we just we didn't have that sort of. Uh, you had to go down to the NFB and watch them on little yeah. screens. We had no access. Well, it just so happened that while I was in art school, it was a golden moment for animation in England, mm-hmm. and um, there was a there was a, comp- a yearly competition called Animate that saw a lot of wonderful films get made, and there was um, the uh, uh, British Film Institute, various funding bodies uh, that really supported animated films, mm-hmm. and um, all the Quays films were. Produced by a fellow uh, Royal College of Art uh, friend called Keith Griffiths, okay. who again fought to get these films made, um, and uh, it was cumulatively to a degree. You once you start to see one or two people make uh, get those films made, then others are interested, and suddenly you got a little movement. Yeah, um, I, mean, I um, remember when it reached us here. It was they were presented in cinematex in, in yeah. anthologies, but yeah. they weren't showcased in the same way they were sort of these curios that came over oh, right. and people gawked at them and wondered yes. and left yeah but yes but they but they also they broke through into um, regular media because the mm. Quays made uh, television commercials for ridiculous uh, products you know paint and you know um, and they made music videos and they made stings for MTV, so they re- re- they really broke through into with this very esoteric world, yeah. broke through into the uh, mass media just for a while. It was a really wonderful a little moment. Yeah, that window was open, right? Yeah. I mean, it, it was possible that advertising agencies were coping with music video and trying to figure out how to contextualize the new movements that were coming up. I mean, now I'm I'm thinking about any kind of influence that's crept in from cinema into. Advertising is really just hiring Wes Anderson to direct credit card commercials. It is a bit. It's and very, very much on that strictly yeah. sort of not commercial. That he's, not that he's bad at it, but no, no that's, but, it, but it's it's that sort of big money end of things. It's not the art side of it at all. I don't think. Yeah, the um, I mean, just the idea of the of the grubbiness and strangeness of this of this film permeating yeah. the world is such an interesting. It's I mean, it's a viral concept now. You, it's. Oh, I know what it is. It's the videotape from the ring. It's look at this strange thing that mm-hmm. you have to share with people. Mm-hmm. And uh, when the Blu-ray of their of their films was released yeah. here, uh, I think it was two years ago now. Yeah. It's just made me realize that I don't think since I'd seen them projected in the maybe the early '90s, I don't think I'd seen them properly. Mm. Um, and of course, with animation, especially with with physical real stop motion, the details are everything. Yeah, and you just don't see that when you're watching a low-res broadcast or finding it on YouTube or something. The, the immersion is just incredible. Yes, and their films, I think, more than anybody's, you you really are made aware that every choice is in every every little grain, every pixel of the picture mm-hmm. is a is a an actual physical choice that they've made. Yeah. And the and the motion of the camera is you very much feel like. Uh, you are being directed by individuals pushing that camera into that you know that particular mo- move, that particular place. The way the light plays, um, every you're you're made aware of every frame of it, every every sixteenth of a second or whatever. Yeah. So it's a, an accumulation of of intelligence and choice and and inspiration. I think that's why it's it feels so rich, mm-hmm. a soup. Um, you may not uh, be uh, absolutely aware of that as, as you're watching it, but it's but it, it really weighs on you to the point where you have to see it again. Yeah. You have to see it again, and 20 years goes by and you see it again, and I'm still seeing shots that I'm not sure I really registered the first time or the tenth time. Or, so yeah. yeah, it's wonderful. My r- most recent experience with just yesterday. Um, no, oh, no. Sorry, this afternoon I can't even remember time anymore. <laughs> um, I watched it again once you chose it, and I, I don't think I really noticed just how. I think soup is an excellent word uh, to explain it. The, the the psychosexuality of it, the the perversity of Towards it. Towards the end, there's Especially, a real anxiety about. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, the, the the image of the the sort of etching of an erection with with testicles made out of kidneys. I think mm-hmm. they are with these sort of pulsing. 
um, Hellraiser. Right. <laughs> um, it's all pins there. Yeah. In it, and then that's that's a beautiful shot of I think it's a glove with a little what looks like pubic hair mm-hmm. just sort of coming out of the glove. I mean, it's really anxious and um, you know there's a, a real uh, anxiety going on there. I really yeah. It still is quite creepy that that moment. That's it. It, get, it gets more and more as you're drawn through this yeah. labyrinth. You start to sort of uh, realize, oh my, that's what we're being drawn that's towards. That's what's at the center. <laughs> yeah, this like this bizarre sexual anxiety. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, because I think people are okay. Maybe not people. Maybe just me. But I think <laughs> I think that we are conditioned with animation uh, to expect safety. For the most part, well, we're yeah. rarely confronted with anything. Mm. Um, just because animation is, you know, it's for kids. It's for it's it's the thing that you're introduced to the conception of it when you're very young. You see Mickey Mouse. I mean, you don't get the teal on a Bible version. You get the clean, sanitized. And especially if you grew up a couple of years after I did, you got the hyper sanitized version where they would cut uh, broadcasters cut the violence out of of Warner Brothers cartoons, oh, right. which was ludicrous. The yeah. shotgun blasts and things like that yeah. because they were afraid that Daffy Duck might traumatize people um, and to suddenly be reminded of the presence of sexuality and the, or the or the element of it while you're watching something like this I mean it's dark and it's adult from the beginning mm. but uh, and there's that flash of that sphincter thing six or seven minutes in but then there's a great deal of sort of calm before it yes. gets agitated again yeah. and it's a it's a really strange disquiet that mm. runs through it and then suddenly yeah, when it explodes and when you realize what it is it's mm. like oh that's where we've been going this yeah. whole time as you say but I think watching I mean you're just not used to seeing that level of confrontational imagery no that's, that's quite a cultural thing I mean in, in um, the uh, uh, Eastern Europe Eastern European tradition uh, yeah. it, it, animation and uh, poster design and, and uh, children's stories and all of those sorts of things have a much darker sense about them they, they the children's stories are there very much to um, be a, a safe place to take children through very difficult emotions mm-hmm. um, because they're going to have to face them as adults so that's why those stories are told Whereas, which, I, which I really agree with I think that's a wonderful uh, use for children's fiction and then animation often was the only way that uh, people in repressive regimes could speak out they had to use metaphor and they had to use um, forms that uh, uh, obfuscated a more obvious political message mm-hmm. um, Schwankmeier certainly was banned from making films for a while um, so I think those traditions are really there but the Quays aren't political they're romantic yeah um, but uh, they've they've taken in all that all that those feelings and those uh, dark labyrinthine places from their travels around Poland I think they straight after art school they did the travels around all the places that they knew from the films that they loved and then they come back with with this a different view completely really um, because they're American uh, but they live in England um, and they are they're, they're very sort of romantic souls really um, but they're steeped in this very disquieting world in Hungary and Poland and the Czech Republic. Yeah, I remember people referring to their work as Kafka-esque at the time, and it doesn't feel that way. It just I think people confuse no. the lighting with the intent. Yes, uh, and the, uh, the I mean, there's a there's a feeling of um, uh, uh, being sort of confused by the world and strange rituals going on that you're not party to the rules of, and all that sort of stuff, which is I suppose is a little bit Kafka-esque, Kafka-esque. but it's not really about the political systems or anything like that yeah it it's, never seemed to make sense to me as no, a comparison it's much more about just everyday anxiety in, in life I think mm-hmm. and that you can you can um, relate to that no matter where you are yeah and the, the idea of desire of mm. inexpress, inexpressible desire that mm. runs through this one specifically mm. is something that's just not part of Kafka I mean I suppose it's part of Literature. It's, part, mm. it's it's a it's a deeply literary concept, but probably more part of uh, Bruno Schultz's writing, mm-hmm. which was more personal, uh, set up these strange convoluted metaphors. But it was much more personal, confessional. I think. Yeah, I mean, it feels like an anxious wail. It feels like 
somebody is grappling with something that they don't fully understand. Yeah. And as the audience, you're simply in that position. I yeah. don't fully comprehend what I'm seeing, but I get a vibe, I get a, an emotional wave that makes me yeah. feel pain. And Yeah, and I think that's why I like this film more than any, because this was the one where they found that voice. Yeah. And they've made films before, and they're, some of the, you know, they're really lovely as well, and it's lovely seeing them find their feet. And, and they made a couple of films about composers which are terrific. I wish they were available. They're, they're, they're not available. Yeah, I don't think I've seen them. Uh, they, they, again, they were broadcast on TV and I would take them off the telly. But it's not the same as having a lovely, a lovely version of them. Yeah. But they did a film about Janacek, which is just beautiful. And then one about Stravinsky, which is extraordinary, with these little puppet, mm. with, with sort of folded faces of Cocteau and Picasso and Stravinsky. And oh, wow. Just brilliant. Um, so it was great seeing those. But then this was the one where I thought they found their voice. And they've made films since that I thought have been also beautiful. The Comb is beautiful, and a couple of the others. But this, something about seeing people, you can see that they've found it and they're, they're discovering it. Mm. Um, and you can, I mean, I, I didn't, I don't, I don't really, I've met them a couple of times, I don't really know them at all. But, and I certainly didn't know them then. But I can imagine there's a couple of shots in there where the, you, you could imagine them just seeing, you know, making it. Yeah. One of them is behind the camera, one of them is puppeteering, and the light is happening, and they then expose the film and see it for the first time. And you can imagine that elation of, we, you know, the, 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 the door has opened and the, the mists have cleared, and we're finally seeing an image that, uh, uh, you know, we, we've been trying to excavate, and here, there it is. Yeah. Uh, I, I would think that with something like this, with precision is possible, where you can actually create literally anything. Mm. It must be incredibly frustrating to only be able to realize that a frame at a time. Mm. Like just the sheer, the sheer length of the effort. Yes. Like you cannot do it in a day. You have to commit weeks or months yeah. to the creation of this, and then it's only 20 minutes long, and people walk out of it and think, eh. yeah. just It must be incredibly frustrating, especially when it is something that's this potent. Yes. It must, it must give you a very strange sense of time when you've spent so long on one shot. But then there's that moment, that I bet there's also that moment, again, I, d I don't know, I've never mm -hmm. talked to them about it, but there must have been that moment where having spent days on this one particular shot, and then you cut that with the next shot that took days to do, and you have this little sequence that took, you know, that lasts maybe 40 seconds, but then you throw a, a bit of the music against it, and suddenly it explodes into life. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's, that's been the only time when I've been making uh, when I've been fortunate enough to make films and I've cut, cut a sequence together and then I've just found a bit of music that I think captures the mood uh, correctly just to, just to throw against it, just to see how it works and it works that's the only time I've ever been uh, surprised by my own work okay. to the point where I can you know, smile about my own work when you're drawing and painting it all takes so long that um, nothing really surprises you and you can get to the end of it and you Okay, that, that worked out okay, but it's not that it's not the same shock and awe of seeing somebody else's work for the first time that's complete. Sure, um, but that is close to it when you cut something together and then throw some music against it and run it for the first time and it works. Um, it's glorious. Uh, do you fall in love with your temp tracks or do you? I do. I think yes. Um, I'm sure everybody does. Um, well, you hear stories, uh, you know, people like Ridley Scott, who ends up insisting that they keep whatever it is he used, and yes. other people who choose something specifically because they don't want to use it because they don't want to be trapped into their first impression. Yeah, it's a minefield, isn't it? <laughs> um, <laughs> it fascinates me just because there are there is an infinity of choices. You can go forever. Yes, and but and so often the music I've I've found has really led the edit and made the images start to work and I owe so much to the music if I've used a bit of temp school of course I really fall in love with it yeah. and I, I've even started to notice in other people's films where they've clearly used a bit of Shostakovich and they couldn't clear it and they had to <laughs> compose something a bit of cod Shostakovich to, um, and I've been in that position as well but uh, so um, I mean, I've tried to get round it by um, uh, creating my own music ahead of time and then I'm so my own music is the temp score so even if I have to chop and change it a little bit um, at least it's mine and that's okay or I've simply had to 
create my own versions of those scores and it's heartbreaking at first to screw it up and throw it away yeah. um, but in a way it's done its job and you have to um, try and even improve on it I mean, there, w- there will always be beats that were missing from the temp score Right. Uh, that you can now put into the music that you're writing for it. Okay. Well, and I think we're, we're circling it at, at this point anyway, but the final question on the podcast is always the same, which is, what, if anything, of, of the Street of Crocodiles have you used or referenced or borrowed or even absorbed into your own creative DNA? Well, I chose this film really because, uh, really as a, as a way of saying thank you to it, um, because uh, it, it's gone so far into my DNA that I'm almost unaware of the time, the number of times where I referenced it, okay. to the point where I, 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 the first feature film I made was called Mirror Mask, and uh, uh, honestly, there's very little of it I can stand to watch again. Um, but there's a sequence in it with some uh, mechanical dolls that come out of uh, in this large mirror sort of room and um, put the lead, lead actress Stephanie Leonidas under some sort of hypnotism and dress her and change her um, and I, we finished the whole thing and I wrote it I wrote that sequence and then I, then I worked out the music for it I, uh, it, it was a, a version of a Burt Bacharach a weird version of a Burt Bacharach song um, called Close to You and um, it was pretty much done when I watched <laughs> Street of Crocodiles again and realised I've just it's, just it's in Street of Crocodiles it's that scene in Street of Crocodiles so um, I, I got all the way through it and without realising um, I'm basically just recycling that. It's, it's completely got under my skin. The, the atmosphere of it was a huge influence on um, a comic that I did called Arkham Asylum. Mm-hmm. You can see the influence there. Um, I mean, the use of the music um, is a big influence on uh, some of the other films that I've made. Um, even the project that I've just finished now, Black Dog. Um, ev- it's so much about it, really. Uh, and also, as a, um, all of my films have been in some way love letters to silent film, and that is as well. I think, uh, especially the beginning. If you watch the little prelude at the beginning with the man coming in to set the machine in motion, the live action footage, the live action footage is framed very much like a a silent movie mm-hmm. and it, the, the light pulses like a silent film there is no dialogue a uh, bit of whistling that's about it um, so it, it's it's so much part of uh, uh, of my work and life and it had such a huge impact on me that um, I'm still hugely grateful to have seen it oh, that's great and your own short films you were saying are about to be Repackaged yeah, I mean, this sounds like an appalling plug now. No, uh, no. That uh, I chose a short film and, I, and it happens to be coincided. Um, but yeah, uh, finally um, managing to get my short films together. Um, I started making films in, when was it, 1996 ish, something like that. Um, I'd done a good, about a good 10 years of, of uh, illustration and painting and, and um, photography and graphic novels and things and certainly that's how I knew your work and, and, but I always fancied making a film but I didn't just want to make a film that um, that any, anybody else could have made um, and I liked the feeling and atmosphere I was starting to get in my illustrations so I wanted to try and find a, a way of turning uh, of moving uh, of taking that feeling into moving pictures so I did two initially two short films uh, one silly funny one called The Week Before about the week before God made the world so it's the week when God shows up on Monday morning with the best intentions of making the world but can't think of anything <laughs> and then another one which is much more melancholy and atmospheric called Neon which is even more uh, I would say a love letter to both silent films and the Quays um, and then there have been other films along the way so they're all going to be on a Blu-ray and a nice book with posters and images uh, that were done uh, as the films were being made and uh, afterwards. And that's coming out later in 2017? Uh, I think it's later in 2017 or maybe touching into next year, but that's from Dark Horse. All right, I will keep an eye out for it. Okay. My thanks to Dave McKeon, who's working on all sorts of fascinating things right now and performing Black Dog in venues around the world. 
You can keep an eye on his movements by checking in with him at davemckeon.com, which is also where you'll be able to find release updates on that collection of short films we were just talking about. Thanks also to Natalie Atkinson. She knows what she did. You can find Dave on Twitter at Dave McKeon, all one word, and you can find Street of Crocodiles on Blu-ray and DVD in the Key Brothers Collected Short Films from Zeitgeist Films, now distributed by Kino Lorber. Looks great. You should definitely watch it in the highest definition possible. Uh, If you're in the UK, it's available on a BFI collection of Key Brothers films, also pretty spectacular. As always, you can find me on Twitter at Norm Wilner and elsewhere on the internet at nowtoronto.com. You can also find this podcast on Twitter at Semcast, S-E-M-Cast, and on the web at someoneelsesmovie.com. If you want to leave a review on iTunes, that would be very kind of you. Um, Please don't pick up the rusty scissors. Thanks for listening.